Ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll discuss the Endangered Species Act and NCBA's efforts to reform this troublesome law. Plus, hear how members of the U.S. beef industry are working to define and measure sustainability. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Auctioner. As beef producers know all too well, decisions made in Washington, D.C. can have a huge impact on your business. This is especially true for public lands ranchers, which is why the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and the Public Lands Council advocate on behalf of those ranchers that hold public lands grazing permits. Joining me now from the Washington, D.C. office is Ethan Lane. He's executive director of the Public Lands Council and the executive director of Federal Lands for NCBA. Thanks for coming back to the show, Ethan. Glad to be with you, Kevin. Now, can you remind us of the valuable role that public lands play in the beef cattle industry? Absolutely. You know, for most of our producers across the country that operate solely on private land, their decision-making process on when to graze and how to graze and, and how to run their operation really is under their control for the most part. Uh, the federal government really doesn't enter in, into their operation in a, in a substantive way except in areas like waters of the United States and things like that that we're fighting on other fronts. Uh, so they're free to make the decisions that are best for their operations. As we move into the West and we talk about the 14 Western states where we have approximately 250 million acres of federal grazing permit ground, the situation changes dramatically. Those ranchers that rely on federal grazing permits to make their operations work year round have an incredibly different set of circumstances under which they must operate that include day-to-day -day interaction and, and uh, review processes and permitting and approvals with federal agencies, whether it's the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, or others. So that adds a layer of, uh, of compliance and, and uh, a management that, that is just totally different than what the rest of the country is used to dealing with. And it also provides an opportunity for those ranchers to serve as sort of a laboratory, unfortunately, for federal government overreach and, and uh, policies that we then see start to creep east. So quite often we see some of these things out west before they, they impact ranchers in other parts of the country. One issue we've talked a lot about on this show that public lands ranchers deal with is the Endangered Species Act. Ethan, what reforms need to be made and what's the political outlook? So the Endangered Species Act is something that we've been working on for years. Obviously, it, it impacts the cattle and sheep industry both uh, substantially. And uh, as we've moved towards the 40th anniversary now of the uh, creation of the Endangered Species Act, we've seen it start to fail more and more. We have more than 2,000 species listed under the Endangered Species Act right now. About half of those are in the United States. And a large percentage of those really don't need to be on the list anymore. Either they have already been recovered or they really didn't need to be uh, listed in the first place. And part of the reason for that is this extremely professionalized and prolific litigation uh, effort by the environmental community and, and some of these organized groups that have just made a, uh, an absolute booming business out of suing the federal government and demanding they get their way on a variety of species listings. So we've been working with Congress, we've been working with the Western governors for several years now to try to craft a path forward that gets the focus of the Endangered Species Act back on the species that really need the help and away from those litigants and their agenda. So we think we have some recommendations now that are going to uh, meet, uh, meet those tests. The Western governors voted and submitted those recommendations back in June. Um, we've been working with Congress ever since to try to get a bill put together that answers those questions and does so in a bipartisan way because we know that the Endangered Species Act is one of the most popular laws in the country with, with uh, uh, the public, especially those that don't have to deal with it on a daily basis. So we really want to make an effort to make sure that this law works for everybody and that it works the way the American people think it does. We think we have that path forward now and we look forward to working with Congress and the administration to try to push that forward over the next few months. This is certainly an issue that Western ranchers have been grappling with for a long time, but does it have the potential to impact all ranchers? Absolutely, it already is. 
Uh, we've seen a lot of species that have, that have started to impact uh, ranchers in the, uh, in the Midwest and now even further east. The lesser prairie chicken in Texas and Kansas and Oklahoma is a, is a prime example of that. That's a species that occurs 95% on private land. Uh, another obviously is the, is the gray wolf. There are about 4,000 gray wolves in the Great Lakes region that are really wreaking havoc for cattle producers uh, in places like Minnesota and Michigan and Wyoming and uh, Wisconsin. And uh, you know, those are species that really need to be moved off the list and, and kept off the list because they're being conserved effectively at the state level. Having the federal government put in another layer of protection on top of that doesn't help the species, it simply gums up the system. So we're working with Congress on that. We're working with uh, our affiliates in, in those states to try to get those species moved off the list just as we're seeing additional species come online. Uh, we've seen over the last couple years some species like the northern long-eared bat across more than 30 states in the upper Midwest and over into the East Coast. Uh, we're looking at the monarch butterfly that's now under evaluation by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they'll have a decision on that in the next couple years. That's a species that really has the potential to impact producers across a wide swath of the middle of the country. So it's something we're paying very close attention to. But yeah, absolutely, these are species that are now starting to impact private land ranchers outside of the West. So what can cattle producers do to get engaged in this issue? I'm glad you asked. This is a really important uh, issue to cover at the local level. We talk about this constantly in Washington. We're prolific in the press and covering this nationally and making sure our lawmakers on Capitol Hill know what's going on with this issue and how it impacts producers at home. But what we need to do a better job of in this industry is, is voicing our opinions at the local level. We monitor the media comprehensively here at NCBA in DC and what we see is opinion pieces and editorials and articles and those local papers across the country from the environmental community offering a full-throated defense of the Endangered Species Act. We need to make sure that we're telling the other side of that story at the local level. So we need to make sure that our producers around the country are making their voices heard, that they're reaching out to those local papers and they're telling their story and they're making sure folks understand why and how this, this law is impacting them and how we need to change it to ensure that it works properly. Thanks again, Ethan, for joining us today. Great to be with you. The Endangered Species Act is just one of the problems public lands ranchers deal with on a daily basis. We ask some of them to share their concerns about the issues that impact their operations. Of course, we don't own the land, and we're permitted to run cattle on the land, cattle or sheep, in our case, it's all cattle. And, you know, it's uh, because of that, because it's public lands, it's open to the public, and we support that. I mean, we support the multiple use concept, but the same token, we also put up with the public. And almost all of us, it's an increasing problem, you know, that we have to put up with the public. Um, it's also, we cannot manage things the way we would like to manage them, uh, because we have to go through the whole government process, the NEPA process, and it's, uh, it's a quite a hassle. You, we don't have flexibility in how we run cattle, where we turn cattle out. It's all done on a plan. And if they deviate, if the, they, the BLM, in our case BLM, if they deviate from that plan, they're, they're for sure going to get sued. You know, the endangered species hits us a little harder than it would just on strictly private lands. Uh, that uh, is a little harder to get around there, and that's probably in Wyoming, that's probably one of our biggest issues between the grizzly bear, the wolf, pebbles jumping mouse, the sage grouse, uh, you name it. I mean, it's, we're, we're, we're obliterated with endangered species and how do we manage them plus do our business that we have to. For more information on regulatory challenges and the issues that impact federal lands and the ranchers that graze there, be sure to visit the website publiclandscouncil.org. And don't forget, you can help in the fight against regulations that threaten cattle producers and their livelihood by joining NCBA. It's easy to do, just visit the website ncba.org or you can call 1-866-USA-BEEF. Meanwhile, America's beef producers have long been leaders in the area of sustainability. The only way we're going to meet growing global demand is by balancing environmental responsibility and economic opportunity.
A diverse group of beef industry stakeholders formed the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef in order to advance, support, and communicate continuous improvement in sustainability of the U.S. beef value chain. We asked some of the U.S. RSB leadership to give us an update on their progress. The roundtable really was uh, put together to build a framework um, around creating or, or producing sustainable beef. And that sounds really simple, but it's, uh, it's an enormous task because we have to involve every sector in the beef value chain. So that means the cow-calf sector, the feeding sector, the processing sector, and the end user sector. And then we have to um, identify indicators that are common across each sector. So for example, water. And then, and then so water is common and it's a very precious resource for each sector. And then what the round table did is it identified water as one of the key indicators. And then it was responsible for developing a measurement for each of those sectors. How do we measure water so that once we can measure it and benchmark it, we can identify means in which we could be better, we could improve. So the round table really has an enormous task of developing or creating or agreeing upon all those indicators in which we have, we've got six of them and then metrics to measure those indicators by sector. So that's really one of the big purposes of the round table, to focus on producing sustainable beef, but building the process to do so. Uh, some will define sustainability as just being able to pass on from one generation to the other. And uh, I would argue that that's part of it, but not all of it because really what we're trying to do is identify areas for improvement and continual improvement and how can we be more efficient and how can we be better at utilizing the resources that we've got um, in producing beef. And so anybody, multi-generational, will learn from participating in the round table on, on things that deal with efficiency because there's always opportunity for improvement. We think we're a pretty efficient industry and maybe we are, but uh, I've learned uh, through the round table and, and you know, just exercises around how can we do it better next year than we did this year and how can we be more competitive as a protein. There's opportunity and engagement in this kind of organization, again, whichever generation you come from, my father, my grandfather, or my son, uh, would all gain from uh, participation. You can follow the work of the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef at their website, usrsb.org. And be sure to check out beefresearch.org for the latest updates on the sustainability efforts NCBA is undertaking as a contractor to the beef checkoff. Up next on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll discuss how the Federation of State Beef Councils helps put checkoff dollars to work. And later, we'll take you to an award-winning ranch in Kansas. Don't go away, we'll be right back. Want more profit out of your pasture? Then here's our two cents on using parasite control to make some dollars. In a trial of calves, long range outperformed Cydectin and Safeguard dewormers combined by as much as an extra 40 pounds. Yeah, that's a lot of extra profit. And that's why it pays to treat cattle with long range. Do not treat within 48 days of slaughter. Not for use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older, including dry dairy cows or in veal calves. Post-injection site damage can occur. These reactions have disappeared without treatment. You can't afford another season without long range. There is a new world out there, revealing itself in unpredictable ways. A world that demands more from the land and those who grow, farm, and build on it. This new world calls for the ingenuity to get more out of it, while preserving as much as we can. After all, to stay ahead of tomorrow, we need to be equipped for it today. New Holland, equipped for a new world. Hello everybody, Stormy Warren here from Sirius XM's The Highway. Join me at the 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show in Phoenix, Arizona. Come explore over six acres of displays for more than 350 companies during the best cattle industry trade show. Plus, you can have some fun with my friend comedian Bill Ingvall at our exclusive Cowboy Comedy Club. So blaze a trail to Phoenix, January 31st to February 2nd. Find out more at BeefUSA.org. Welcome back. One way the industry stimulates beef demand is through the work of the beef checkoff. The $1 a head checkoff is divided among many great programs 
that help to increase consumer demand. Here to talk more about these efforts is Todd Johnson, Vice President of Federation Services and Governance for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Todd, thanks so, so much for coming to the show. You bet. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the program. You bet. So NCBA is one of actually many contractors to the beef checkoff. Can you share with our viewers the process that is involved in becoming a contractor to the beef checkoff? Yeah, first I want to share that I think it's significant how producers put this program together in the mid-80s, over 30 years ago, and they built producer control and input into the program. And that is manifested through the operating committee. Uh, so first of all, when they wrote the law, they established the operating committee to be represented by 10 members from the Cattlemen's Beef Board and 10 members from the Federation of State Beef Councils. So those 20 producers come together on an annual basis to award funds from the operating committee. But they also put an extra layer of producer control into the program, and they said that the contracts must be granted to organizations that are national in scope, industry governed, and they do this on a cost recovery basis. So there's a, a limited number of organizations that are eligible to receive contracting dollars, uh, but the uh, stipulations to manage those dollars effectively are very strong. Fantastic. And tell us a little bit about some of the outcomes NCB achieved last year uh, on behalf of the Beef Checkoff. Yeah, a lot of the programs we do are a continuation year after year, building on foundational work that's been done uh, previously. But a couple big wins this year. One was the release of the, the Beef Wise Diet, uh, which is weight improvement, satisfaction, and energy. Basically proves that people can lose weight, maintain muscle mass, uh, and maintain heart health on a diet that includes lean beef. So excited about that. Uh, we've also had great outreach through the Beef Quality Assurance Program and specifically the National Beef Quality Audit. That audit is rolled out every five years and it gives the industry a benchmark for improvements that we have made and areas for improvement to look at in the future. Um, previous audits have demonstrated the, the change in locations for injection sites, right. for example, right? right? So the quality audit was rolled out. Mm -hmm. I have also had great impact uh, in, our, in our digital space. Mm -hmm. um, we've reached a million likes on the Beef is West for Dinner Facebook page. Wow. So great consumer acceptance of um, uh, what Beef is What's for Dinner is mm -hmm. all about. Mm -hmm. So some really neat things happening there on the consumer front as well as the benefits to the producer side. That's outstanding. And I understand that uh, the Beef Promotion Operating Committee met just last month mm -hmm. to award contract dollars for this upcoming year. Yeah. I have some questions about that, but before we do, can you tell us why is the Operating Committee so important in and of itself? Yeah, as I referenced, the structure is so significant that, that those 20 producers that are challenged with investing about 35 to $37 million a year um, they don't do that in a vacuum. It really starts from the grassroots level and twice a year cattle producers from across the country come together through the committee structure. Uh, those committees meet at the annual convention and then again at the summer business meeting and during the committee process they surface the priorities that they want contractors to work on. Now those priorities are all tied back to the long-range plan and so as contractors, uh, which NCBA is one, we take that information, build our programs, present it to the operating committee uh, and with budgets, of course, and then they have to make the tough decisions of mm -hmm. which get funded and which don't based on limited resources. So tell us about some of those priorities and, and maybe uh, give us an insight into some of the specific projects that will be funded by checkoff dollars in the coming year. Yeah, a really uh, big one that we're excited about is our producer image campaign. Mm. Uh, data has told us that consumers continue to have questions about how beef is, beef is raised and brought to them through the processing system. Sure. So a, a significant amount of efforts placed around a producer image campaign mm. that will include videos, uh, behind the scene videos, still photos, mm -hmm. digital campaign to help consumers connect with our producer audience. Mm -hmm. So that's one campaign and it ties in nicely with an updated Beef It's What's For Dinner website. Mm -hmm. uh, so if viewers have not visited Beef It's What's For Dinner, please do. A uh, totally revamped website that answers every question you would have about beef production and recipes and nutrition and safety. So those two big things are big for the coming year. Uh, and we also have continued great outreach to the Masters of Beef Advocacy Program mm -hmm. with over 10,000 people involved in that. And then the Beef Quality Assurance Program, I think we're over 8,000 producers that are now certified through BQA, uh, including uh, transportation guidelines, uh, a Spanish uh, printed version. So great outreach there to our producer audience. That's outstanding. Well, certainly as we grow this uh, cow herd and grow our supply, we need that demand to continue. So thank you for everything you and all the other contractors do right. on behalf of beef producers. Thanks. It's our privilege. So as Todd mentioned, be sure to check out the newly remodeled Beef It's What's For Dinner website. And you can also like the Beef It's What's For Dinner Facebook page to see beef promotion efforts in action. 
Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll show you an operation in Kansas that's going above and beyond to protect the land for future generations. And later, you'll hear about another way NCBA is working to educate producers and improve their bottom lines. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Out here, we're hostile, cold, and cruel. Our way of life. There's no better way to live. Guts. Glory. Ram. What does it mean to be an American cattleman? It means you have what it takes where it counts. On the inside. At Ritchie, we understand that. It's what's on the inside that defines us. We share the same values. Ingenuity. Commitment. Sense of pride. These are the values that built this country. They're the values that built this company. Ritchie. Proud to be a partner to the American Cattlemen since 1921. Welcome back. This week, we're wrapping up our series honoring the 2017 regional winners of the Environmental Stewardship Award. All of these operations are dedicated to preserving and protecting their natural resources for future generations that will one day live and work on the land. Let's head to Kansas for a look at the winners from Region 7. The Flint Hills region of the Tallgrass Prairie is home to Munson Angus Farms. The Munson family has been a fixture in this part of Kansas for almost 150 years. You get west of Junction City and I think you find out that you're related to almost everybody mothers or fathers or st someone along the grandfathers and that grandmothers that type of thing but yes uh, we uh, have been in the same location uh, my great granddad started out just west of Junction City in 1869. Chuck and Deanna Munson are the current owners and counting their grandchildren there have been six generations of Munson family members to live on and work this land. Today Munson Angus is a thriving farm built on their pasture-to-plate business model. I'd call it a diversified operation. We, we have both Angus cattle herd and a small farm feedlot and uh, also a cropping operation for cattle feed and then also some cash crops. You certainly learn to realize that um, quantity is not nearly as important as quality and uh, doing it the right way. And uh, that's always been I think the number one philosophy of the Munson family and the product that's produced. The Munsons believe that to raise top quality beef, you need the best cattle. Their registered Angus herd started in the 1920s, and the genetics from those original animals can still be found in the cattle grazing the land today. And they go back to some of the original of Andy Schuler, who was a well, well known in the Angus business. That's how, how, how our herd got started. Now we're going almost up to 65 years now that we've had the Angus business. We like to think now that the, our calves uh, almost look like clones because of they, they're such genetic uniformity. Over the years, the Munsons have worked with state and local agencies to improve the health of the land. They implemented a rotational grazing system to protect their valuable grass resources. On the crop side, the Munson switched from conventional tillage to a no-till system to reduce erosion and improve soil health. One of the main things we've done is went to no-till, and that's uh, been a benefit both from less tillage it needed and labor on that, and expense on that part of it, and also uh, it certainly helped conserve moisture. One of the things that has always impressed me has been their care for the environment and the natural resources. They're always concerned as much about taking care of the resource as making a profit. If something was going to bring more profit, but at the expense of, of the natural resources and the environment, they wouldn't do it. In 2006, the nearby Smoky Hill River was identified as an area of concern for erosion. 
Chuck worked to unite neighboring landowners along the river to apply for stream bank stabilization funding to help address this critical issue. We were losing up to five acres of land a year to, uh, to stream bank erosion uh, along the river banks. And uh, until this project was available and came along, why we didn't have much choice but just to watch the land uh, kind of cave in the river. Chuck was one of the first ones in the office to sign up. He helped us organize uh, meetings to talk about these projects. They have a great love for the Flint Hills and for the work that they do here in it. That has always stood out in my mind as kind of an example for how people ought to conduct themselves and uh, it's been a great pleasure to work with them. The difference was tremendous. I mean, we stopped the erosion. We stopped the eating of the riverbank. We stopped from losing trees. And the best part about it, we saved valuable farm ground that would have went right down into the river, which river bottom farm ground around here is very valuable. And we saved a lot of it by doing that. The ranch's innovative pasture to plate philosophy has come full circle with the opening of Munson's Prime in Junction City. Their restaurant is a unique way for the family to not only serve prime beef, but also share their story with the public. It was totally open with the concept of, I like to say, to showcase the Munson meat. That is definitely a, a part of it. And to help the world to understand what good livestock production is like, what agriculture of today is like, and uh, just to educate to a great degree also. You can even see the Munson's love for the land in their own backyard. Deanna has an extensive garden that features many plants native to Kansas. The Munson family is a prime example of how a cattle operation can be managed in a sustainable way while still being profitable thanks to hard work, innovation, and dedication. There's been a lot of blood, sweat, and tears involved in putting the place together and keeping it going. And It's an everyday job and it's going to continue to be. We're not a fly-by-night type of business. We've been in the Angus business going on over 60 years, so we didn't come in yesterday and we're not going to be gone tomorrow. The Munson family has always placed extremely high emphasis on the environmental and stewardship issues, not just from wanting to treat the world right, but that's what it takes to be successful doing the type of business that we attempt to do. I will be very surprised if Munson Angus Farms is not still here 50 years, 100 years from now. Now, if you'd like to find out more about the Environmental Stewardship Award winners, see photos and videos from their operations, or even learn how to nominate someone for the award, visit environmentalstewardship.org. Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll discuss a one-of-a-kind producer education opportunity that you don't want to miss. And later, hear what members of the cattle industry think about the NCBA trade show. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Say goodbye to your toughest pasture and rangeland weeds for good. Because one product offers season-long control, handles the widest spectrum of broadleaf weeds, and clears the way for increased forage with greater grazing flexibility. So you get more beef per acre at a cost that can't be beat. It's Grazon Next HL Herbicide. And if it's in your pastures, plain and simple, weeds won't be. Blaze a trail to Phoenix, Arizona and the 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show. It's the cattle industry's biggest convention with education, networking, and fun. Plus, you can check out the huge NCBA Trade Show, outstanding entertainment, and more. Don't miss the 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show in Phoenix, January 31st through February 2nd. Visit BeefUSA.org for more. You're watching NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen on RFD-TV. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association takes great pride in being a premier source of producer education through a variety of programs. Here to discuss the Cattlemen's webinar series is Josh White, NCBA's Executive Director of Producer Education, and Dr. Dare Bullock, Extension Professor of Beef Cattle Genetics at the University of Kentucky. 
Thanks so much for coming, gentlemen. Glad yeah. to be here. Josh, I know you and the producer education team launched this Cattlemen's webinar series several years ago. How have those been received? Well, we, uh, you know, when you when you start something new, you never know how it's going to go. But we've been really uh, pleasantly surprised with how much pickup we got right from the start. Uh, we typically have anywhere from 50 to 200 folks join us live, and then we'll have upward of a thousand folks that'll come back in and watch a recording that we post up after the webinar. So. Um, it's really given us the opportunity to do continuing education throughout the year on a variety of timely topics. And you're starting something new this year, is that right? That's right. So, you know, our model has been to do six or seven webinars a year, make them timely, seasonal, uh, when, when folks are looking at specific production practices or decision-making times, uh, when there's a great update to come out on policy, et cetera. But uh, what we've noticed is that some of our biggest viewership is when we focus on genetics in the spring and we've typically done a, a webinar in February or March mm -hmm. around genetics or bull selection. So we, uh, you know, that's why Dare is here because we reached out to the eBeef team that he's part of to think about, you know, how could we expand that, uh, that offering in the spring. And we are glad to have you, Dare. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Tell us a little bit about the eBeef team. Uh, the eBeef team is a group of six uh, beef extension specialists from five different institutions. Uh, we have Jared Decker from University of Missouri, Allison Van Enenam at Cal, uh, University of California, Davis, uh, Matt Spangler at uh, University of Nebraska, and then we have Megan Rolfe and Bob Weber at uh, Kansas State University and myself at University of Kentucky. Uh, the, the six of us kind of got together and, and we realized that that it's fairly a limited source resource in terms of genetic specialists across the country. Mm -hmm. And so even though we provide education in our own states, we kind of felt an obligation to provide more education on a national basis um, because there's a lot of states that don't have the opportunity to have a, a genetic specialist in their sure. state. So we decided to put together a one-stop shopping website, which we call ebeef.org. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where cattlemen can go and, and find information about basically anything to do with genetics of beef cattle. And so um, we, we have uh, both video, uh, fact sheets, uh, frequently asked questions, uh, a lot of resources there uh, for beef producers. That is an all-star genetics team for sure. And uh, you could have partnered with a lot of folks. Why NCBA? Actually, Kevin, we've, we've partnered with NCBA on an informal manner for years. Uh, working with the, the Cattlemen's College and also doing webinar series in the past. Uh, we did it more formally this time because we, we feel this is important for, for cattlemen to get more information a, a, about the upcoming breeding season and, and to get the most up-to-date genetics information. And there's no better way to get that word out than through NCBA and, and, the, and the programs that go on through here through the educational program. Uh, it just reaches so many cattlemen, and, and we felt this was just too good an opportunity. That's outstanding. And tell us this, I mean, are these programs more designed for beginning cattlemen or seed stock producers or cow-calf people, or, or who's it designed for? Uh, we like to think it's for most anybody that, that deals with any kind of genetics issues. In other words, from the seed stock guy, we hope that we, hope that we have information that would be valuable to the elite seed stock breeder. Uh, we also hope that we have information that's going to benefit that first time person or even somebody getting into the cattle industry. We hope that they would do their research and this would be a good opportunity to learn a, a lot about the genetic side of the beef industry even before getting in. So we, we think it's a, a, a we, we hope to reach everybody, right. Yeah, absolutely, that's actually great news. And Josh, for folks to, to learn more about the upcoming webinar series, where can they go? Well, Beef USA. Uh, that's always uh, the best place to go. We have a producer education tab right there on the website. Um, you can find access the past recordings as well. So there are a few genetics uh, recordings if you want to brush up a bit before we even start this series. But we're looking forward to starting off 2018 with a bang with this uh, series. So I believe the first one will be January 18th. So check out the website for all the details. And you mentioned that website. There are some other producer education materials on that website as well, aren't there? That's right. You know, um, last year we developed a um, a resource for antibiotic use, you know, was in the news a lot around changing regulations. So we've got information all the way from, from that topic to Cattlemen's College, what's coming up, and industry statistics. So yeah, it's a great stop to, to look for information on beef cattle. 
Fantastic. Well, genetics uh, are one of those topics that, that I'm very, very passionate about, and I think we can all learn and grow and improve in the beef cattle industry. So thank you for uh, making this coordinated effort to help us all learn more about that topic. You bet. Looking forward to it. As Josh mentioned, you can visit beefusa.org for all the details on the upcoming genetics webinar series. While there, you can also watch past webinars and catch up on any sessions that you may have missed. Still ahead, we'll check in with cowboy poet Baxter Black. Plus, we'll see how one Nebraska operation is utilizing Batril 100 from Bayer to help battle BRD. Stay with us. No matter what job I've got to do, my John Deere 5E tractor can do it all. Whether I'm cutting, moving feed, or building a fence. Using my 5E means my work gets done faster at a price I can afford, and that works for me. No storm is too powerful for New Purina wind and rain storm minerals, formulated with ultimate weather resistance. That means more minerals in the feeder and available to your cattle. Wind and rain storm minerals provide more consistent intake and balanced mineral nutrition to optimize herd health and breedback rates. See the difference at your local Purina dealer or visit cattlenutrition.com. Wind and rain storm minerals, another way Purina is building better cattle. Fall is a busy time of year for cattle producers and their cattle, which means additional stress on both you and your herd. Stress is a contributing factor in many issues, including bovine respiratory disease, or BRD. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter takes us to Nebraska to learn how some producers are battling this costly disease. Bovine respiratory disease is not only one of the most costly diseases cattle producers face, it's also one of the most complicated. Many pathogens and factors can lead to an outbreak in your herd. Bovine respiratory disease is a complex that we frequently see in cattle, primarily weaning aged and young cattle, a yearling age or less, though you can see it at all ages. It's a, it's a disease pattern that's often set up with stress exposure to viruses and uh, also the presence of bacteria that uh, under periods of stress in, such as weaning, castration, inclement weather, exposure to other animals, it's uh, very common that we have an increase in sickness of the respiratory disease. Well, BRD is something we always fight. Um, uh, stress, everything brings it on when we bring them in. It's a multifactorial disease that's very complex because a lot of times it starts with a virus which is caused by stress on the animal and then it turns into a bacterial infection and that's when, when you usually see the telltale signs of, of pneumonia in a calf. But it can happen at any time in the calf's life. I think almost one out of five cattle succumb to BRD, 16.2% is what the data says and 40% of the mortality in, in the cattle industry is actually caused by BRD. Good management practices can help manage the factors that lead to BRD, but when an outbreak occurs, it's important to know what to look for. It takes a very astute observer uh, to, to notice the, the cardinal signs of respiratory disease in cattle. One of the things we look for is depression, and there's varying degrees of depression. Is that animal off? Is he just not awareness? Maybe there's a little bit of a look in his eye that may be a little bit off. Is he off feed? Is his appetite a little bit less? Those, those could be something that you could look for. Oftentimes you can look for a respiratory index for basically is, is he breathing a little bit faster? Uh, that may, may or may not be involved with some degree of a nasal discharge. He may or may not have some open mouth breathing, but oftentimes he may have a higher respiratory rate than say his penmates that are normal. And another criteria we use is, is if we've made the decision to pull that animal, we'll probably most commonly get a rectal temperature on him to see if he's running a fever or not. That, that's, that's an indication of how his body's trying to respond to the inflammation in his lungs. When detecting a sick calf for BRD, there's many things that a person looks for. Experience at riding pens is 
the best way that you're going to find them. Signs include ears down, if a calf's head's down, it's sunken up, hanging off to the back of the pen. There's more than just one sign that you really have to look for. There's a lot of different things depending on the cattle. Every calf's different and they're going to show different signs. These cattle are rode every day, no matter you know, Christmas, holidays, every day, 365. It's just very important, animal health every day. I mean, you'll see these cow, these guys riding through here, they, they walk, they're at a walk, everything is examined, at a slow, stress-free pace, and that's what we expect. Some of our best guys are feed truck drivers because they pull up here with feed, and if, if this pen's not reactive to that pen and that ration, they can see well, who's sick because they're not coming to the bunk. BRD, he has to be diagnosed by clinical signs and, and taking a temperature in an animal and seeing if they have a fever. But once that it's, it's determined that the animal has BRD, then you need to have a line of treatment. Well, we're gonna use this antimicrobial as a first treatment. This antimicrobial as a second treatment. You need to follow those rules strictly and be sure and, and keep records of those cattle. That, would know, that way you know what that, that calf has had and what it needs next. After diagnosing BRD, it's important to kill the bacteria that's causing it quickly so the animal can get back to good health and back to eating and gaining weight. That's why an effective treatment that works in a single dose is important to include in your BRD protocol. It's important to get cattle treated and performing back into that home pen because when they're on feed, that they're doing their job and making us money and that's why we're here. It's not for practice. Uh, we take this seriously, and when that, when that steer or heifer is back in the pen doing his job, we feel like we've done our job. Antibiotics are really important in the feedlot industry. You know, if, if we can't treat those animals, it's, it's not just necessarily our bottom line, but it's the welfare of the animals. We believe in the best animal welfare as we can here at the feedlot, and using antibiotics is a tool that we can use to help the animal welfare. You know, if, if we can give them an antibiotic, they're going to be back up and fill in their normal selves a lot sooner than not having that tool available to us. Working with our veterinarian, we've set up a number of protocols to address BRD in our feedlot. One of the tools available in treating BRD in our operation is Baetril 100. Baetril 100 is an injectable antibiotic that, that I use in many of the feedlots that I work with. It is, a, it is an antibiotic that can be very effective in its mode of action and combating bovine respiratory disease. Batril 100's unique formulation gets right to work, killing the bacteria at the site of infection within one to two hours of treatment. And its single dose effectiveness means cost savings to producers. So the active ingredient in Batril 100 is, is enrofloxacin. Enrofloxin. It's a fluoroquinolone antimicrobial. And what it does is actually destroy the, the DNA in the bacteria, it penetrates the cell and destroys the DNA and actually kills the bacteria instead just prevents its growth. Batril 100 is labeled for the treatment of BRD and the control of BRD in high-risk cattle. And it's also labeled for all four major pathogens that cause the BRD. We like having Batril 100, which is a fluoroquinolone, as an option for our treatments of BRD. It's a different type of an antibiotic than many of the others, it's a different classification. We seem to get a very good response and it's a single dose option. It fits very well into our protocols that we have for many of the feedlots. Batril 100, uh, we'll use it on a pen, like the high risk pen that's coming in. We'll, we will give a mass treating to the entire pen where they all receive that antibiotic, Batril 100 and uh, we've seen results from it. We think it's affordable. We've used Batril for a long time on uh, treating, and uh, it seems to be really good. You know, it's always been a standby drug since we've been in the stock business. I trust Batril 100 because it's been in our operation since we started, and it's always been very effective. BRD is a daily issue for many cattle producers, but having a treatment plan in place can help manage this costly disease. I'm Brian Baxter reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. To learn more about Batril 100 and how to use it in your BRD protocol, visit Batril100.com. When we return, it's time for another visit with our good friend Baxter Black. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay Tough Fence will last three times longer and is four times stronger than low tensile fencing. High tensile wire solid vertical stays, and tight fixed knots all provide superior strength. 
you will use fewer posts, saving time, labor, and money. Protect your investment for generations with Stay Tough Fence. Stay strong. Stay tight. Stay tough. Did you know that Prefert makes over a thousand different farm, ranch, and rodeo items? And now, thanks to Prefert Direct, it's easier than ever before to get access to every item Prefert makes delivered direct to your local dealer. For more information about Prefert Direct, visit us at prefert.com. Prefert, America's number one name in farm, ranch, and rodeo. When a new calf hits the ground, his clock starts ticking. A belly full of colostrum gives him his best odds, but if he doesn't get any, his time starts running out. That's when you grab a bag of Oxford Ag Colostrum in their patented feeding system. Fill them with warm water, shake it to mix, feed it with a tube or nipple, and you are done! No bucket, no bottle, no mess, and right on time. Get yours at OxfordAg.com. Cost less than a dead calf. Dear Baxter, as a fellow veterinarian, I'm hoping you can help me. My wife Nancy has two cow dogs that will readily obey commands until they get near a cow. Then they chase the critter and can't hear a word we say. It's obvious to me they go deaf near livestock. So what's your diagnosis? Signed, Anxious Enticiding, Dr. L.W. Dear L.W., I am pleased to inform you that your wife's two cow dogs are suffering from a malady that is common in blue healers. It also occurs in species further down the food chain, like backyard horses or bird dogs or teenagers. Your suggested diagnosis associates their problem with the nearness of cattle. However, research at the NASA Cow Dog Behavioral Institute in Kabul, Missouri, indicated a relationship more closely related to the proximity of the dominant figure, i.e., the greater the distance between the master, which is you, and the dog, the less your influence. The technical name for the syndrome is called Progressive Dumb Dog Detachment Amnesia, or PDA. Now, there are some social scientists who believe that PDA is a result of a broken home, a puppyhood trauma, or sucking hind tit. However, extensive studies have been done to discover a method to change the PDA dog's behavior, such as necking him to a mule or letting him drag a hundred foot of log chain. Although these techniques can alter his direction, they often interfere with his mobility in the corral. Probably the most state-of-the-art information has come from a sheep herder in Alcova, Wyoming. It is his contention that there is nothing wrong with the dog's hearing, his breeding, or his training. Your dog is simply evolving into a thinking being and has simply chosen to ignore you. My advice, live with it or leave him home. This is Baxter Black from out there. Now that's good advice about cow dogs from our good friend, Baxter Black. Now, for more than 30 years, producers have trusted NCBA's Red Book to help them keep better records. The 2018 Red Books are on sale now. You can even customize yours with a company name or logo on orders of 100 or more. Just visit the website ncba.org or call 1-800-525-525. 3085 to place your order. We'll have more right after this. Forward. It's more than a direction. It's mandatory. Because the beef business rewards the progressive, the doers, the ones who know what it takes to go easy on cattle and never set them back. So set your eyes on the horizon, turn your back to the wind, and move your herd the only way you know. Forward. Vista Vaccines. Always ahead. 
Hey everybody, I'm Stormy Warren from Sirius XM's The Highway. Join me for the 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show in Phoenix, January 31st through February 2nd. You can find out more at beefusa.org. Welcome back. We're getting closer every day to the 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA trade show in Phoenix, Arizona. It's a unique and fun environment for cattle industry members to come together to network, create policy, and have a little fun. We asked several producers to share their thoughts on the trade show and why it's a highlight of the event. Here's what they said. What I'd have to say that I like about the trade show uh, would first be uh, what my girls like about it. And uh, that's all the new stuff that they get to see from the equipment uh, to the products. Uh, but for myself, it gives me the opportunity to meet with a lot of these businesses that we do business with on a daily basis, but also to see what else is available, what else is out there for this operation that I'm a part of, and what opportunities there are to, to improve what we do on a daily basis. It's just fun to walk around and, and see all the different products, um, see all the different booths that are there, they meet with the exhibitors and talk with them. There's such a wide variety of people. You don't even know some of them existed until you get there. I think the trade show is a great chance just to come and see all the new toys that they have for ranchers and farmers and it's great just to go out there and say, hey, my tractor is about to break down. Here's the new model and see, you can compare, you can just walk around, take a look at everything. Oh, the trade show is fantastic. That's, uh, that's one of the highlights. I mean, that's the other. I mean, you go there to do, you roll up your sleeves and do the work in the committee meetings and such, but the trade show is just phenomenal. Convention registration is now open, so don't wait. Sign up today. The 2018 convention runs from January 31st through February 2nd. Go to ncba.org for all the details on how to register for this can't-miss event. Well, that's our time for this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you again next week right here on RFD TV.